Welcome to the Maxon booth here at NAB 2022. I am your host, Matthias, a.k.a. Major VFX on all the social media platforms. We are streaming live on the 3dmotionshow.com. Hello, interwebs. I am here with our amazing internal training team. Some of you may know them for many, many years, as I have our good friends. Um, well, we have Simon and Chad today from the Demystifying series, but I'll let them get into it because we had a little snafu, and I'm going to blame that on... Uh, I'll just blame it on... And no, Chad, it's your fault. <laughs> it's, it was Chad. Chad did this. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll let Simon and Chad take it from here. The Demystifying crew are trying to... Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see you all. It's great to be here. It's great to be real, uh, real life. You know, to borrow a phrase from Maxon, we're socializing in all dimensions. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty exciting stuff. Very good. Simon, start us off. Get the, get the strap line in, absolutely. Yeah. So regular viewers of our training sessions will know that we do a demystifying session every Monday. Um, and in fact, we do loads of webinars. So if you happen to go to the Maxon site, just go to events and you can see all these amazing things that we pretty much do a webinar every day. And so this session is the fourth in our April sessions where we're doing a voyage across all the different tools. Because as Chad was alluding, Maxon has tools that span the entire creative process. So we wanted to join the dots for this. And so Chad's then come up with this amazing thing where you can take something from cinema, you can put it through After Effects, turns up in Premiere Pro. So he's gonna take you through that journey, that voyage if you like today. But um, if you want to catch any of the previous sessions that we've done over the last years now, just hop over to YouTube, go to the Maxon training team, and we've got all the recordings here. And then here's, for example, here's the ones that we've been doing over the last months and months and months. In fact, there's the, there's the one for the voyages across applications. So, Chad, I'm yes. going to... Tee you up. Okay. Tag team. And by Tag the way, time. if you've got any questions, please chuck them into the chat. We're doing this live. So if you've got live. any questions live as well, please ask us. Interrupt us, because that's the style of these demystifying sessions. Yes. Tell um, us what we're doing wrong. So um, just to recap, uh, like Simon mentioned, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, series about voyaging. Because, you know, the world's opening up and we're traveling and doing stuff. So it's like a great theme. Like here, let's take content in one place and you know, let it hop on over to another one. So uh, just as a recap, if you're, if you're interested, um, well, as the, th the thumbnail might suggest, uh, we covered uh, fainting in the 19th century. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so the first thing we did in week one was uh, we went through transitions, and we created transitions in cinema, and then we went on like a little voyage to bring those over through Cineware into uh, After Effects using the take system. And then uh, we used Redshift and used Light Groups, kind of like we were saying did, uh, to uh, take uh, a day render and a night render and combine them in After Effects using the Light Groups and relight it in, uh, in After Effects using those uh, render passes, which is really cool. And then uh, last Monday, we went uh, from Cinema 4D to Unreal and looked at the Cineware workflow, which is pretty cool. And we also uh, did this cool thing which is kind of fun and relates to today. We went through uh, trap code form and created a loop and then brought that into uh, uh, Unreal as well using Cineware and uh, yeah, it was a good time. So what we're gonna talk about today, the voyage we'll be going on, is gonna be taking stuff from uh, trap code applications and After Effects and then bringing them over, traveling over to Adobe Premiere in the edit. And I think just really quick up front, there's a couple, things that are beneficial about that workflow. Number one, you know, once you get over to editorial, it's a different mindset. You're kind of like, you're telling the story, you're assembling everything, you're kind of getting a vibe for like the tone. And like, you don't wanna like fiddle with like sliders and buttons and you know, visual effects things. You wanna be like in that mindset. So if you are working solo, this workflow of the, using the Mogurts, taking data from After Effects to Premiere, can help you just kind of stay in that mindset. You can take over the data that you need from After Effects to Premiere without having to go back to After Effects and kind of get in that zone again, which is very helpful, I think. And if you're working on a team where you're uh, doing After Effects and then handing it over to someone else, uh, that someone else in the editorial might not have the same design aesthetics or the same preferences for visual effects or design or whatever. So we can hand our stuff over to them and control how much 
they're able to do with our stuff so they could still make changes on their end without you know, messing up the whole pipeline and just kind of make tweaks on their end without having to kind of like bring it back over to you. So let's go into After Effects. And I set up this project in uh, Trap Code Mirror. And um, we don't have time to go through like every little step. And also that's kind of not as fun to watch, but, but we're gonna just gonna give you like the heads up and I'm gonna show you how we can bring this over into Premiere to uh, fiddle with it. Because as I was preparing this, I was like, okay, like what can you not do? What, are you, what is Premiere famous for not doing? <laughs> like what is like a like famously uh, a limitation of Premiere? And I was like, 3D. 3D, particles, Premiere just can't do it at all. So I was like, well, let's go get some 3D into Premiere. Let's get some particles into Premiere and figure out a way to make that happen. So um, I'm just going to give you, again, just like the gist of this. I'm going to go to the Find Presets panel. I'm going to apply Trap Code Mirror. Um, I like to start out with the solid sometimes, because then it's kind of like a magician thing, since we're in Vegas. You know, like there's no tricks up my sleeve. I'm applying Mirror from scratch. We're starting from here. So then I open up Geometry, and uh, if you've never used Trap Code Mirror before, uh, it's a pretty awesome tool. It's very flexible. It's a weird one. It's a weird, unusual tool, but uh, very, very flexible and powerful. So it uh, basically just creates a sheet of 3D mesh. And that's like all the backstory that you need to follow along with this episode. It's just a 3D sheet of mesh. And you can um, control it by a plane where we can like displace it and just have like a sheet, a 3D sheet. Or you could kind of like wrap it around a model. So I can choose 3D model. And uh, if you don't do 3D modeling, that's fine. Because you can click choose model. And then there's um, like all the trap code stuff, you know, like trap code form and mirror come with this browser, this library of 3D objects that you can use. So I could scroll down and peruse my way through the, uh, the objects that uh, ship for free with trap code stuff. And down here, and it's kind of like a, um, a particleated, <laughs> um, there is a speaker. What is, like, why is, I'm, I'm, am I not spelling this correctly? It starts with an S, a speaker. The speaker, there's S. It's under S. It's under S, yeah, which comes after S-O-S-P. It's in the right place. I have no one to blame but, for my, but myself for that. So now I have this uh, 3D object, and I could create a camera to uh, prove to you. That's it, whoops. Uh, to prove to you this is actually a three-dimensional object. And, you know, that's not uh, super amazing, but then I could go and add uh, a light to this which is also not super amazing if it's a white light on a white object. But uh, hang with me, folks. It gets better. And uh, I could give this a light. And now um, this is sli slightly better. And so I can uh, move this light and I can relight it. Now, this doesn't look that amazing yet because uh, this texture that we have is just like white. And so it doesn't really feel uh, believable. So I could go in here into the material section and uh, let's say I'll change the color, give it a, a speakery gray. And now you could see that we have this kind of like three dimensional object. And uh, then I could go into mirror and I could do some fun stuff to it. Like with the repeater, I can create a bunch of instances and then I can, uh, by default, the instances are like on top of themselves. You can't see anything. So then I have to fiddle with them, like translate them along the X axis. There we go. And maybe push them back in the Z axis and maybe scale them down and do this some more. And after some fiddling and uh, adding like a rim light and uh, some other stuff, then we have this dilly bobber. And uh, can you see that okay? Is that too dark? It feels dark on my screen. I'm gonna do this like a artificial thing where we're just bumping up the exposure artificially just so you can see what's going down because I designed it all dark style. So now we have uh, this, which is basically, you know, like I have some rim lights and stuff like that. And uh, there's a, a, a few layers of mirror. There's one, the speakers on the left. There's one for the speakers on the right. There's a one in the, the background. There's like a little like, uh, one of the presets, the 3D objects is like this little like squiggle, little 3D squiggle. And so then I just like rotated those around in a circle on the left hand side. So like I uh, have these squiggles and I can go to uh, UU to see all my things. And you can see my instances. And I could take down my instances so you can see what that looks like. So there's one squiggle and then rotate it around. We have 16 squiggles was the correct number of squiggles for this project. 
Uh, that's the, the accurate squiggle quotient. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn this off. This is getting in my way. The title action safe. So what I want to do is I want to be able to take this into Adobe Premiere, and I want to be able to fiddle with this and adjust the 3Dness in Adobe Premiere. And the way that we do that is by creating a Mogurt. And so what I can do is go to the Window menu, and uh, there's nothing like a, a, a Mogurt anything. So what we need to do is go to the Essential Graphics panel. So Window, Essential Graphics. So Chad, just in yes. case anyone doesn't want to, what is a Mogurt? A Mogurt, oh, okay, so thank you. Uh, Mogurt is a short, it's a file format, and it's short for Motion Graphics Template. So that's where the M-O, Motion, and then G-R is the Graphics, T is the Template, so Mogurt is the name for a Motion Graphics Template. And that's the file that's the, uh, the Traveler thing that, that goes from uh, the Carrier Pigeon, if you will, that goes from After Effects uh, to Premiere. Um, now, for some reason, this is already set up, so I'm going to, uh, delete all this stuff. Pretend that this isn't here, because this is like a spoiler of what we're about to do right now. Um, but what I can do, oh wait, that was the wrong composition. So this is an important step. I forget this all the time, and I just forgot it right this second in front of your very eyes. Uh, but I can go to, uh, I need to select this composition from this primary thing, and that's really important. Then I need to give it a name. That's also uh, important. And uh, because we're in trap code mirror and we're making Mogurts, I called this a Mirgurt. <laughs> huh? Right? Jokes are free. Jokes are free. Okay, so what I can do here is uh, click on uh, Solo Supported Properties. And once I've selected the right composition, then I can click Solo Supported Properties. And then what happens is the timeline populates with all of the stuff that we could potentially add to our Moger. So I am going to add, I don't even need these layers, I'm just going to close these up. Doop, 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 doop. Okay, so I come to this layer that's the left side, the left side speakers. And what I can do here is going to the geometry where I can adjust stuff. Let's say, for example, the uh, rotate X, you know, I can move that like that. And that's pretty fun. I'd like to be able to do that in Premiere. So I, I can drag this and drop this into this field. And then when I create this Mogurt and I go into Premiere, I can adjust the mirror stuff from Premiere. And what's kind of cool is it's using the After Effects engine and doing that. So all of the lighting and stuff that we set up in After Effects, like all the, whatever we do in Premiere, it's going to be as if we were doing an After Effects. So it's going to react to the lights. It's going to do all that kind of stuff, So which is, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, but I don't want to do this just yet because I, I want to set this up in a more intelligent way. And I think when you're creating Mogurts, that's like my best tip is uh, I get maybe, maybe it's just me, I get a little eager, get a little excited, it's fun. Um, and so I'm just excited to just get in there and like, I'm gonna make my mogurt. But um, it, you'll have better results if you kind of like think through what am I going to want to do in Premiere? Because it's, it's kind of challenging to uh, fiddle with the mogurt and start over with it. So it's better just to kind of like set it up the right way right off the bat. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete this because I, I don't want that part of my mogurt yet. Because what I want to do is I want to, I want to make it so that, and that's why I already labeled this, so again, spoiler alert, but uh, what I want to do is have one layer that controls the, uh, the, the speakers for both. Because again, when you're going from After Effects to Premiere and you have the Mogurts, you don't want like every single property because it gets like overwhelming, especially if you're passing off to somebody in editorial who might be kind of overwhelmed by this uh, as it is. So just like a handful of properties maybe is a, is a better way to go. Um, and this is going to create a better result anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the uh, next layer, which is the right side speakers. And I'm going to go to the effect controls panel. Well, they're already open here. And I'm going to option click on rotate X. And I'm going to drag the pick whip over to... A lot of properties in mirror, so I'm scrolling a bit. And I'm going to go to uh, rotate X. And that's all I had to do. So now... What that does is it makes it so that the Rotate X property of the left speakers is controlling. Oh, going to click on that, right? Now they're both going together. They're both going together. So I don't have to adjust them separately. Um, and so what I'm going to do very quickly here is uh, do the same thing on the uh, Y. Drag this up. Actually, you know what? I'm getting bored just doing this, so I'm going to skip ahead. 
um, <laughs> because uh, you, get, you get it. So in the final, what I did, I did a little extra something, something. I'm going to press E twice to reveal my... Exp no, E twice to... Re is that not the keyboard shortcut anymore here? Okay, no, it's freaking out. Okay, so what I did is I linked up the X, Y, and Z um, properties of the, the 3D object uh, with the right speakers to the left speakers. So the left speakers are the controllers. But then what I did is I added a little extra something at the end of the Y and Z, a, a little asterisk. So it's times negative one. So that the right side goes in the opposite direction. So when I go back to my uh, controller here, and I rotate along the x-axis. You see that they both go together. That's fine. That looks cool. But when I rotate in the y-axis, because the other side, the right side, is uh, times negative 1, then it's going in the opposite direction. So then I could do some you know, kind of cool stuff. Same thing with the z. So if we're doing clockwise, counterclockwise, it's going to go in the opposite direction. So let's say I've got all my stuff all ready. And I could just do this here. So let's say I, uh, oh, I deleted it. Okay, whatever. So let's say I have uh, all of my settings here. And actually, I'll just do this really quickly. Okay, I'll just say rotate X. Uh, a couple of things that are very powerful about the Moger. Again, before you, lo before you hit the, the powerful export motion graphics template button, which kind of like seals the deal and makes that your Moger, um, we have two very important things to fiddle with here. One on the left here is the name. And like, again, we want to make everything as like simple, clean as possible. So mirror three rotate X is like, uh, that's not great. We could condense that and make that a little bit uh, more efficient. Like we're editors looking at copy, you know, and being like, okay, what about 3D X axis rotation? Um, or if we're like dealing with somebody who doesn't know 3D, we just say like 3D left left, right, if we want to do that, whatever. Um, and then when people see it in Premiere, they don't have to know that it's Mirror. They don't have to know it's like the X axis or whatever. They just know it rotates left, right, and like that makes sense. And we know it's like 3D artists, like it's not left or right, but you know, good enough, they get it. Uh, another thing that's really important is, especially as if you're a designer and you're handing this off to somebody, um, if you click on Edit Range, this allows you to change the range of the slider in Premiere. So a scary thing that designers often face is like, if I'm, if I'm going to make a Mogert, I'm going to hand this off to somebody in editorial who is not a designer, like, that's kind of dangerous because that gives them a lot of power to mess up all this, like, gorgeous stuff that I made. So by saying, okay, instead of, like, neg the default negative 90 to 90 degrees, maybe we just, like, give them, like, I don't know, negative 15 degrees to 15 degrees. And that's as much as we're willing to let an editor fiddle with our stuff. And also sometimes, too, like if you're, you know, a client, you're working with a client and the design's not finalized yet, maybe you want it to be like over in this area or over in this area. Maybe you want it to be like this big or this big and they can't, they're going back and forth. You could still just keep going with your project and just let those options be the case uh, in editorial through the Mogert where you can let the editors choose how big you want. Because you know the client's like, well, it's like this big or this big. And so you can just set it up to be that big or that big and give that range to the editor to fiddle with it there. So when you're done, you click Export Motion Graphics Template. This does take a bit to load in Premiere, so I've done this already. So this is like the cooking show, you know, where I've done it and chopped the stuff. And then I can be like, oh, look it, it's already like chopped. And you don't have to sit there and wait for me to chop a bunch of crap that's boring. So um, I go to, um, here's the workflow. In Premiere, I go to Window. And I go to uh, Essential Graphics, and I open that panel up, which looks like this thing on the right-hand side here. And then it, this is kind of this is a tricky thing too. There's a Browse button and an Edit button. And so if you're in the Edit button, that's where you fiddle with stuff, and Browse is where you go to find stuff. So when you're in Browse, you can uh, add new stuff by going to this button in the bottom right-hand corner. Y'all seeing that? It's like bottom right hand corner is like a little plus icon there. So if I click that, you can see the thing says install motion graphics template, tool, uh, the tooltip there. Click that button and then you can navigate to your Mogurts or whatever. So I can sit there and I can you know, try to find my, my stuff and then click on bring that in. Again, I've already done that here. And then also this is another thing that if I don't use Mogurts for a while, I always forget. 
uh, is that the way to use this in your project, like I always want to drag this and drop this into my project panel like an asset, and you can't do that. You have to have a sequence already going and then drag it from the essential graphics panel into the sequence. And then you go get yourself a cup of coffee or you know, chat with a friend, uh, and then it will uh, load up. But then here's the benefit then. You're seeing I'm here in Adobe Premiere. Look, you're seeing Adobe Premiere Pro, and I have my 3D mirror loaded up, and then I go to the central graphics uh, panel, uh, not the browse tab anymore, because we already got our right moger. Go to edit, and now I he have here all of my properties that I set up, and I can then uh, rotate this left and right, and uh, it's pretty snappy also. I mean, um, for 3D in Premiere, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, I think. I mean, so hang on, yeah, okay. you're, in, you're in Premiere. I'm in Pro Adobe Premiere. And you're editing 3D. <laughs> yes, are you, are you mocking me because I overemphasized that? <laughs> <laughs> are we in Premiere doing 3D? We're in Premiere doing 3D. I think it's cool. I know, whatever. That it's is fine. very cool. It's fine. I think it's cool. Hey, Chad, i got a question for you. Yes, sir. So you started this off in Mia yes. using the 3D tools in Mia. Mm -hmm. But since, um, since Mia can import 3D yes. and objects, and yes. in fact, it can import cinema objects, mm -hmm. could, could you start off in cinema and I end see up where in you're Premiere? Going. Yes, Simon, you absolutely can. So what? Yeah, and I after I made this, I was like, oh, I probably should have shown that, but I, I didn't show it. But yes, you can actually use native C4D files in Trap Code Mirror. You could load those up, and you even animated the C4D files. It's like you do your stuff in Cinema, bring it over into After Effects, and you could use it in Trap Code Mirror as a 3D object. And then you could do the Mogurt business we've been doing into Premiere. So you can then make your whatever in Cinema 4D, make a cloners and you know, whatever your business is, and then you go over into Mirror, fiddle with it, and then you could bring this over and adjust your Cinema 4D files live in Adobe Premiere while you're doing the edit. And you know, it's pretty cool. You get a warning if you're using an external effect, like a third party thing like Mirror, it's like, well, it's gonna be slow, but like, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's some really interesting comments coming through on the chat here. Meme Game is saying, so this is some Harry Potter stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, if I get burned at the stake for showing some dark arts, <laughs> like, it was worth it. It was worth it. It was great. Um, okay, so in the time allotted, which is, like, not very much, I'm just going to run through very quickly some other things. So I'm not going to show you, like, uh, step by step like that, because we know how to do it now, hopefully. Um, so then I'm just going to instead uh, show you some other like use cases. So one of the things that I did was I went into uh, trap code particular. Oh, oh, so here's a fun thing. Simon taught me a thing. I'm going to give Simon some credit here. Simon taught oh, yeah. me a fun thing because uh, when I loaded up this project right now on this machine, I realized I didn't put this footage in the right spot. And oh, by the way, you can use footage in a Mogurt now. So up to like two gigabytes. So if you have like a video clip and that's part of what's going on, like if you're having particles that are referencing a video clip or whatever, you could actually bundle that up as a Mogurt and bring both of those over and video can be stored inside the Mogurt, which is really cool. And it's going to save my butt right now because I didn't put this in the right spot. So it's like offline and I'm like, oh dang, I'm about to give this presentation in front of like all of these tens of people. And um, I don't have this, uh, this file. And so Simon's like, have no fear, Chad. But he says it really cool because he's from England. And um, so Simon, I'm going to give you control over the mouse. Show us like, how we can uh, rectify my huge blunder. You're talking about what's contained inside a Mogat, aren't you, Chad? That's exactly what okay. I'm talking about. So the idea is that what if you've got a Mogat and you want to access not only the footage or you wanted to control some of the settings in the original After Effects file. So what's interesting is that these essentially are zip files. So we've duplicated this particles Mogat and put it into Mark's particles 2. And Chad, would you be my assistant, please? And oh, type, yes. Type zip there. Yes. And so if you just change the extension of this. Oh, we, we you oh, sorry. too quickly. I You're too excited. Oh for man, that. we're like Laurel and Hardy over here, Simon. Okay. So that we want to use zip. So if we then go in and we double-click this, then we can 
unarchive that and we see what's contained inside that. And inside that is an AE graphic file with the thumbnail that you'll see inside Premiere and also uh, a JSON object file, so, um, which means that you can control, that's the data inside that is referencing the project. But if you do the same thing again, and type AEP, zip, or actually oh, is it zip? zip? It's a zip one. Oh, man. So this is a zip as well. See, that's why Simon's the guy. Okay, here we go. And so if we use zip for that, then, and then we double click on this to open it up again, then inside that file, or inside that archive folder, then you have the original AEP, the original project. So if somebody sends you a MoGut and you just want to tweak it, or actually sneak around all the expressions that you found useful in it, <laughs> sorry, as a backup, then <laughs> you can jump into that and then you can see where the footage is hiding and then here is that file. That Bike parts. So, you so away there. because I had the Mogert, I'm safe because the Mogert was on my heart, my system, and the Mogert has it, but it's been buried. So thanks, Simon. That's an amazing tip. So there's power tip right there. Isn't That's it? an amazing tip. So it's a, it's not zip AEP. It's a zip zip. That's the two things you're renaming everything to zip zip zip. Uh, and that is um, one of my favorite things that I've learned at this conference so far. Like that's some kind of like that's, you know, if I'm Harry Potter, then you're Indiana Jones. <laughs> You know what I mean? You're spelunking and yes. figuring stuff out, which is pretty cool. Uh, so essentially, then I uh, created some uh, dust using one of the presets in uh, particular. If you're not used to particular here, I'll just go ahead and close this panel and effect controls. I'm just going to stash this over there. And I can click the designer to open up the designer. Do, do, do. And over in presets. And over in Dust and Debris, there are all these like really awesome presets. And um, I think I use Floating Dust. And Floating Dust, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really cool, but I really feel like I needed to do some tweaks for the particular footage that I was using. And so I um, adjusted some parameters. Let's see, where's my essential, essential graphic? I closed it, probably. Yeah. Get all irritated by stuff being in my way. I'm like, get out of here. And then I'm like, where did it go? I'm not happy anyway, folks. So here's what I did. I adjusted the, uh, the particles per second, the uh, particle size, particle opacity, and the particle opacity randomness. And I um, enabled that to be seen in Premiere so that uh, the editor can fiddle with it. But again, I, I adjusted those edit range values quite a bit so that the editor doesn't have like power to be like, you know. And also, too, like same thing with like the particle opacity. You know, I, I made it so that like you can't go all the way down to zero because you know you might if as an editor who's not used to working particles, they might like take the particles down and be like, hey, what's up? I can't see my particles, so I just gave it a very narrow window. And then when I'm here in uh, Premiere, dip, 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 particles, then I can see my particles, and it's take a uh, little bit more tactful here. It's probably too tactful to see. I had, I had this balance between like I want you to be able to see what I'm doing but also not have it be like super ridiculous. So then I could select this here, go to my Mo Mogurt and be like, oh, I want more particles. And so then I, I just changed it from like 45 to 65. This is a very small range and I could bump it up between one and two, the size of, you know, stuff like that. So not too much control, but a little bit and enough so that we can uh, have a little bit more control over our particles in Premiere, which is pretty cool. Um, a couple other examples. Uh, I did one with a particular form uh, because form is so versatile and it's just really great for backgrounds. So, um, and I'll very, again, very quickly here. What I did here is I made another uh, gradient, like a gradient layer like this. And then I used it as a layer map in form, which now layer maps are in uh, particular as well. And uh, so I, I made that so you can. See, let's go to form backgrounds final. So then I, I took the colors from the, because you can put multiple layers, uh, uh, properties from multiple layers inside of one Mogurt. So then I put the colors from the map layer and then some of the size things and the particle options in this. And if we had more time, uh, I would have shown you like just a bunch of variations of background objects that you can uh, create quickly. Um, but we don't have the time, so I'll just do this really quick and just show you. you can just be like, okay, I want this to be like more narrow and I want like less particles than X and whatever. And maybe I want to change the particle shape from square to sphere. And maybe I want to, you know, adjust the uh, fractal displacement of these or I want to 
have the fractal noise affect the size, so it's just kind of like random there. So we could just really customize uh, a background. We give some tools to an editor, and they can feel with, uh, fiddle with it and, and make some cool, cool stuff. Uh, one last thing I want to show you here is that uh, a lot of people forget that the C Cinema 4D engine is actually in After Effects. So um, I uh, have this text here that I animated, you know, in a not that thrilling way. But whatever, it's my text, I'm proud of it. So there it goes, it's gonna animate on. And let's say I wanna make this 3D now. What I can do, if I wanna make 3D text, there's a billion different ways to do this. I could obviously go to uh, File, you know, New, and create a Max on Cinema 4D file from like right here, and then go into Cinema and make some 3D text, bring it over to Cineware, yada yada. That's subject for a different presentation. But another thing that we can do is like right here natively in After Effects, we can go to our composition settings. Let's go to the flyout menu and go to composition settings here with uh, this composition for our text. Then we can hop on over to uh, this kind of hidden 3D renderer area. And then uh, the default renderer in a composition in After Effects is the classic 3D renderer. But I can change this to Cinema 4D. And that will allow me to use some Cinema 4D stuff right here in After Effects. I don't have to like do files and do the traveling business. I could just use it natively. And so I can go ahead and click OK here. And now if I open up my text, ba -boom, ba -boom. Um, oh, I got to make it 3D first. Yeah, got to make it 3D first. But once I make it 3D, then I go to geometry options and I can change the bevel style. If to add some bevel, let's just pretend that that's not there. And now I could go to extrusion depth and uh, make this like really thick. So, and this is actually like, again, full 3D stuff. Let's uh, do a camera check so you can tell that I'm not f messing around here. There we go. See, full 3D text right there on the After Effects timeline. And what I did here, I'm just gonna, yeah, maybe I should just undo that, just get back to where it was, there we go. So what I did here is I made this concave, I went into the um, material options, added some reflectivity, and we got this kind of like tune shaded thing. And there we go. And then I used the, uh, the, uh, the popular uh, source rect at time for this, uh, I'd be like a, a background thing, background rectangle. Oh wait, this is my, this is my start thing. Let's go to the final version here. Doo -doo. And I created this expression. This expression might be kind of hairy if you're not used to expressions, but um, here's, we got time. We got like five minutes, I can do this. Um, so what you do is you create some, some, uh, some variables. So first we say, okay, S, and then we make a little, like, whatever. This is like something I got from the internet, but we'll just go with this because it's popular and it's out there. But let's say like, okay, the letter S represents, and then this thing. So what you do is just like, okay, well, I'm just gonna do this, watch. So I say S equals, which is not hard, right? S equals, that's not hard. And then when I have this blinking cursor, I can take this little pick whip here, and I'm going to drag it to this text. Boom, and then it fills out all the mumbo jumbo for you. It's like already, you know, it's already done. It's good. So that's one thing. We set up the S. S represents that layer. So then we have to say, okay, W, that's another variable. W equals S dot source rect at time dot width. So in other words, it's making a rectangle around that layer that's referencing. And then the W represents the width. And then do the same thing with H and then put dot height at the end of it. So then with this bottom, this brackets, that's where we use our vari variables. So the, uh, the size of this rectangle is the width and height, or the W and the H of this text. And that's important and kind of cool because then when we make this a Mogurt over here, if like we have this text and you know, it's all like designed nice and then somebody comes in and says like, hey, instead of check out our fall travel deals, how about check out our September travel deals? And you're like, oh no, but I already did all this stuff. Well, what you could do is just type uh, this here, September. And then it automatically, because of the expression that's being referenced, it automatically resizes the text box around there, which is like pretty cool. So, so hang on a sec, Chad. Yeah, okay. So you're editing new 3D text. Are you in Premiere Pro by any chance? I am in Premiere <laughs> editing 3D text. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. That's great. I just had to think about that. I didn't want to miss an opportunity for yeah. that. Um, okay. So the last thing I'll say in closing 
Uh, I said there was one more thing, and then, then this is like a, a bonus thing. So I'm still counting that as just like the one more thing, and then this is the bonus. But don't forget that through um, Red Giant Universe, which is like a massive suite of effects, I'm going to bring up the... Um, actually, I'll bring up the RG Universe dashboard, which is the best way. If you're not familiar with Red Giant Universe, um, then I recommend uh, doing... It. Sometimes it does this, where it like doesn't uh, do stuff the first time, and i got to close it and reopen it. Imagine this is full of presets. Imagine. <laughs> Close your eyes and let me take you to a place where there are dozens of effects. Uh, let's go to the um, effects panel here. Whoa. What was that? Craziness. Uh, okay. So I have effects. And uh, here we go. Select this layer. And uh, there's no effects. There's not any <laughs> effects at all. OK. You're doing all this without effects. That's incredible. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look, Ma, no effects. Um, OK. Oh, wait, there they are. Just took a minute to show up, but they're here. So in the, um, in the effects area, there's RG Universe. There's like these, all, these, all these different categories. But um, this doesn't count as like really like a traveling thing. You know, the theme is like taking one stuff and going over. But you know, one time there was like a. Uh, a story that I heard where some dude packaged himself up in a FedEx thing and then he shipped himself somewhere. So sometimes, like, the best packages, like, are, they have stuff in them. You know, there's, we can be the package. So uh, stuff is right here in Premiere if you want to do some, like, awesome motion graphics. So this is a thing that I made and uh, I colored it in Premiere. I keyed it in Premiere using Primat. I um, cleaned it up. I added some kind of, like, polished stuff. And then I did this compositing. I created this like uh, this thing with like HUD components, HUD components from um, the uh, RG Universe uh, suite of tools at HUD components. Um, and I added Hollow Matrix to give it this kind of like digital mess. And I added this glow with these streaks to make it feel like it's kind of like being beamed up by her little spy compact or whatever. Everything here done in After Effects, except the motion tracking. I tracked the thing in After Effects. But other than that, everything was done from scratch. Um, in uh, Adobe Premiere. So Mogurts are amazing, and that's the theme, but also as a bonus, there are some great tools uh, in Premiere uh, as well. Simon, was there any like uh, question thingies going down? I should have been like pausing and periodically asking that. There's the, mostly people in the chat still going bonkers earlier on about the, hang on, the <laughs> OMG. The, uh, did, did we mention doing 3D in Premiere? Yeah, let's just do that a few more times as we sign <laughs> off. Take that with you, everybody. Just take this with you, 3D and Premiere. Don't think about how long it took me to get set up or any of the other blunders that I made or how I ran out of time. Let's just all take this with us and, like, only this. Only but, this. But this, um, apart from being a, a wonderful excuse to do this exercise, <laughs> there, there is a pragmatic approach to this. So if, if you're a, an editor and you want to have a slightly different background or effect, you don't want to have to go back to the graphics team and say, hey, do this, re-render this. Or you may be the graphics team. Yeah. So you may have to think, oh, I don't want to have to render it out again. So you're giving the ability to, on the timeline at the last minute, be able to do a change and make a background effect change without having to do that whole process all over again. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, OK, well, that, that's the whole thing, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, attending, people online, one Simon. Thing, one more thing we oh, can do. Yes, yes, yes. Would you mind, my trusty assistant, jump over to um, Safari? Yes. Since we have your attention. Yes. Um, would, uh, let's go over to the Maxon Events page. OK. Oh, we're, we're here. We've got oh. a tab already. Oh, yeah, okay. I got you. There we go. Okay. So just check this out. If we scroll down slightly, do it. I just wanted to say that starting next Monday, we have another whole series of demystifying webinars. And this time, we're doing it entirely on Redshift. And we've got our Redshift experts, in, including our very own Ellie Wade. And we will be jumping in to um, Redshift. But it's a challenge. So we're going to, as it says here, we're going to say to our experts, you can't use your favorite tool in Redshift. You have to work around and find a different way. Because we find a lot of artists have their favorite way. But sometimes it can be limiting to the, the sort of style that you're creating. So we're going to get the audience to vote which thing they, the artist can't <laughs> use. And then live in that one hour session, they're going to have to create something from a, 
um, a model, a ZBrush model that also the audience are going to choose and oh. do that without whatever tool, tool they're choosing. <laughs> So that it's, that it's a nice thing to kind of interact with, but the reason is to expand your knowledge and make you appreciate what it is that to, to use different tools that you would do normally. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Force you into so, different workflows. Like, how would you do this if you yeah. couldn't Absolutely. do stuff? So, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey. Whoa, whoa. hey, hey. <laughs> There's a person hi, there all of a sudden. Hi. What's up, Matthias? Hey, you guys are just getting carried away. Oh, yeah. So, um, is this thing on? Yeah, it is on. So, um, we have zero questions here. Let's take a picture for the high internet. You'll see this. There we go. Um, great job. I see. It seems like you're just like tormenting your fellow trainers. It's just like, <laughs> that's, yeah, let's just, you know. That's my job. Why don't you twist an ankle and then run this race? That's, uh, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be great. So um, stay tuned. We're going to be up next with our next presenter, Wendy Duarte. So uh, Duarte, yes? Yes. All right. So she's here. She's going to get ready. She's going to be up next. So give us about five minutes. We'll be back on track. If you have questions for Simon and Chad, they will be in the back for the next hour and probably the rest of the show. So, uh, yeah, if you see him, come say hi. We will see you in just a moment. Thanks, everybody.